Most of us are in our defenses and in inhibitory emotions for many reasons. It's a symptom of really the lack of emotion education and priority for that in our cultures. Now, what do you think the cost of that is? Anxiety, depression, addiction, everything practically besides those that are organic diseases. I am Drew Ramsey, MD, and I'm here with another one of my super favorite, wonderful mental health peeps, uh, Hillary Jacobs Hendel. I'm going to read your, her bio, but we're just going to have a wonderful episode here talking about the self, authenticity, accelerated psychodynamic psychotherapy, which, boy, that sounds exciting to me. But let me just tell you a little bit about Hillary Jacobs Hendel. She's an author of the international award-winning book, It's Not Always Depression, Working the Change Triangle to Listen to the Body, Discover Core Emotions, and Connect to Your Authentic Self, all things we're all wanting when we think about mental fitness. Uh, that came out with Random House and then Penguin uh, in the UK. She received her bachelor's in biochemistry from Wesleyan University um, and an MSW from Fordham University. She's a certified psychoanalyst and AEDP psychotherapist and supervisor. She's published articles in the New York Times, one of them directly influenced my clinical practice because she gave us permission to hug, which I called her right afterwards. I was like, Hillary, really? I can hug a patient? She said, yes. Uh, she's uh, got articles in The Times and NBC, Think, Fox, Oprah. Her blog is read worldwide. And she's got lots of wonderful free resources. And one of my favorite things that Hillary does are these emotional education and emotional awareness workshops. There's, there's so much we talk about, right, in mental fitness, about increasing emotional awareness. But then there's like a question like how, you know, what do we do besides just having like a, you know, a, a tea with a friend or talking more? Um, she's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, her website we'll link to in the show notes is uh, hillaryjacobshendel.com. But most importantly, you're here with us right now. Hillary, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Drew. I would never have said no to you. You know that. Well, <laughs> well we, we've, we've known each other for a little bit and, and for everyone listening, you know, I, I've, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've spent my career some ways here on the internet, but but uh, initially mostly in New York. And I remember meeting you, Hillary, because I was, uh, it was probably about 10 or 15 years ago. And I was just kind of branching out of that. I was a very conventional, I'd been, you know, uh, kind of in training, very conventional and say in some ways like conservative structure of psychiatry. And I went to some sort of social event where it was like the grooviest, coolest <laughs> <laughs> psychiatrists and therapists and psychoanalysts in New York were having this like really fun party. And, and I'm looking around I'm like, who are these cool cats? And also you came up to me and, and you both knew who I was, but you were so kind. And suddenly I just had this feeling of being part of a bigger community of mental health professionals. And so it's been a treat being friends with you and, and have you in, uh, really encouraged me in all this work. So Welcome to the podcast. What, first of all, tell everybody, where, where are you right now? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Drew. And that, that's a, such a nice memory. Those were the shrinks drink days, as we called them. Yeah. And those were so much fun. I am currently at this very moment in Connecticut, but my office is really near yours and or where your office used to be or where your office still is in New York City on the Upper West Side, or where I'm heading back to later today. The Upper West Side for non-New Yorkers is this one of those neighborhoods that is highly, highly concentrated with families, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, psychoanalysts, um, and and it's where my practice uh, when I was based in New York was for you know almost twenty years. Um, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in in psychodynamics, and maybe to start with, what does that mean to you when we start talking about psychodynamics? I mean, what it means to me is just understanding us and and forging a relationship with our ourself, and understanding why we do what we do, why we think what we think, why we feel what we feel, and really understanding that we're a makeup as of genetics and disposition and experiences and the, we can't change our genetics, but the experiences that we had uh, starting from birth or even before deeply affect the wiring of our brain and affect who we become. And 
um, I've always been interested in in psychology, and I grew up with a father who was a psychiatrist, and uh, we were sort of oriented in the family to think about um, why we really why we do the things we do and why we think the things we think. Not much about feelings uh, at that time when I was growing up and emotions, but it was mostly about understanding ourselves. So that's. That's what psychodynamics means to me. What is it? I'm curious. Can I ask what it means to you? Um, you, you can. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> it, it takes me back to a form of thought. I was going to, towards my interview at Columbia. And I realized I didn't have a great definition. I desperately called my aunt, Marcia, who was the analyst in our family. And I said, what? how do you define psychodynamics? And she just said, the unconscious is alive. And that, that really has stuck with me as, as a salient kind of definition or, or feature um, and then all of what you, you said around being curiosity about what's going on in there, how it works, how it's related to where we've come from, how it's related to our own personal genetics and, and kind of structure of our character. And, and then I think the most important thing to me is, is how um, psychodynamics gives us um, hope that through understanding ourselves and using um, our feelings, our relationships and our words that we can... Uh, um, transform something uh, that we need to and, and then transcend into something that we're aspiring. To. Yeah, that's so beautiful, right? That is exactly, exactly right. The only thing I just want to sort of add to that, I don't know how you feel about the, the, the I grew, you know, growing up with a psychiatrist and a psychoanaly, psychoanalytically oriented psychiatrist, we talked about the unconscious, right, all the time. But I think a lot of people can't relate, you know, uh, they get stuck on what exactly that means and and how to make use of it and how can you know what you don't know and um, and there's another way that uh, in AEDP which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, also during this time um, that really resonated even more from a psychodynamic perspective and that's Im- implicit ways of being. It's the same thing. It's that we are wired in a certain way where we're like fish in water. We just are who we are. And it's our implicit way of, of being. And that being a, becoming aware of what is implicit is s- somehow helped my understanding of the unconscious or made it more directly useful in some ways. And I don't know if that's relevant or why I'm even... Well, I think it's super relevant, Hillary. I think I think you're sharing with us in some ways there's something very personal, which is how psychodynamics have worked for you. And I think you're speaking to something that everyone listening, I think, can appreciate, right? That when we talk about mental health, it can get very elusive. It can get kind of ephemeral. I can't quite describe it, right? The unconscious, you said, how do I even know that it's real? And I think par- part of there's such a rich history in, in mental health of um, before before we had so much advanced science of using the mind to understand the mind. Mm-hmm. And that basic idea of, uh, um, I think I've already said it before in the podcast, uh, Otto Kernberg talked about, you know, uh, psychotherapy begins where friendship ends. And this idea that there's this, this, this other kind of relational register in, in terms of understanding, is it true or not, of, of being with another mind idea that, that you, you really need another brain in that ring to understand something about your mind. Not all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, two heads are and, always better than one, I think. <laughs> two heads are better than one. <laughs> but that, I also like that you, you suggest something, one of the reasons that we um, have maybe an aversion to this, or there's so many tropes and cliches about mental health and the unconscious, that we discover implicit things about ourselves. I think one of the painful process, parts of the process for everyone is not all of that is great. We don't just discover our strength and our valor and, you know, we discover our jealousy and our fragility and our ego and humanness and, and um, some of those implicit things about us. Mm-hmm. Yes. At, and at first, right, that's so uncomfortable. And then the, the beauty of that is then it is completely freeing and liberating. Uh, it, so th- and that's something important to, to talk about, I think, that the... Well, it doesn't get talked enough about. I want to I kind of get to some of the liberating and freeing stuff through how you get people there, right? And, and I want to hold up the copies of your book early in this podcast. This everybody I mentioned the book in their bio. It's not depression. I've got the UK version because I'm 
I got the I got the I'm fashionable like that. I just love this cover. I like that cover too, but like isn't yeah. this classic? Isn't it, this it like is. very, very uh it's a it's a little more like medical and this is a little more like, I don't know, touchy feely, I don't know. Um I like them both. I'm just so thrilled that somebody wanted to publish something I wanted to write. Yeah. Two big phrases here that we've got to unpack. One is A E D P advanced experiential uh uh, I'm sorry, or is it accelerated experiential psychodynamic psychotherapy? Yeah, ac- accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy. Thank you. And then the change triangle. And so let's start with the first one, AEDP. Yes, because they're very related. So I'm 39 years old. I decide I want to go back to school to become a psychotherapist. I know I want to go into private practice because I know I am um, this time divorced, two children. I know I have to make a good living to, to survive. Um, tell, tell us, uh, share with everyone what you're doing at this time. What was I doing before? You mean you, my You've career? had a couple of careers. No, I've had time. many careers. I've had a very rickety, um, curvy career. My After I graduated college, I went right into dental school. I was going to be a doctor. That got me a lot of mileage from the age of about three years old to about 20 when I was on this autopilot journey to become a doctor because I got so much positive feedback and affirmation. You know, you can imagine my, my parents went nuts. Oh, you know, our daughter, the doctor. So I never really thought much about it except, oh, this is great. I'll have a lot. I'll make a lot of money. I'll have a lot of prestige. And then I'm pre-med at Wesleyan and I start, you know, at around 20. Now it's a little later, I think, but, but that my sort of reflective function. I was able to kind of like, why do I want to be a doctor? Do I know what it's really like? To make a long story short, I thought I would be too anxious dealing with death and dying and made a a swift curve into dental school, which would utilize the same science and clinical, basically the clinical skills, but no death and dying. So that's, I don't know if I ever told you that story. So that's how I ended up a dentist went to Columbia. I I applied to medical school and dental school. I always have to say, because I had to show my father that I could get into medical school and thank goodness I got into one Mount Sinai. And, but I went to Columbia dental school, became a dentist, hated it with a passion, did it for one more year just to make sure it wasn't school. I hated, but the actual field wasn't for me. And then had, you know, I, but I got married, I had two children, I dabbled in different things, because I always loved working. I worked from the time I was 11 years old, I loved making my own money. And I, um, and I had to because my father's fatal flaw was that he was very tight with money. So he didn't give me any money. So I went out and earned it and always felt a lot of pride in that. Anyway, after I had tried after dentistry, and the kids, and then getting divorced. I went back to work um, first at Maybelline, uh, the cosmetics company. Then when I realized corporate America wasn't my thing, I went and dabbled in nutritional and vitamin stuff, trying to my own business, which was silly because that doesn't work in New York City because there's retail. (laughs) It was a mail order, you know, one of those multi-level marketing things. But I learned a lot about sales then got a job in a startup uh, running sales. And then 9-11 happened. And I no longer wanted to travel. Um, I just was anxious because of what happened um, on 9-11-2001. And and then decided to go back to school to become a psychotherapist. So now I'm 39 years old. I know I want a private practice because I had to make some money to support myself and survive. And um, I thought I would be an analyst because in New York City, to me, that was how to be the most educated and the most qualified. And now I'm about to enter analytic training and somebody says, oh, there's this woman, Diana Fosha, who's got this method, AEDP. And Hillary, I think you would find it very interesting. So this Mm. was a good friend who knew me well since middle school. And I was like, okay, um, let me Google her. And there was a a trauma conference in New York city, an academic conference that I went to where she was speaking along with Dan Siegel, who does Mindsight and um, Tom Stern and uh, Jude Jude Cassidy, I think it was. 
Um, and uh, Diana Fosha did her talk. She put up this upside down triangle and described how emotions work in my mind and body. And I was blown away. And my, my brain was organized in a completely new way that helped me understand myself. And I knew I wanted to study that method as well. And I knew I had to get the psychoanalytic certificate for my own efficacy, you know, um, and I, I did both, but I, 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 I find that AEDP, which is a model that the problem for me with psychoanalysis and CBT is that they're just kind of mostly dealing and emphasizing with thoughts and what we're aware of. And it's missing the body and emotions to be able to affect rapid change. And that's why it's called accelerated and to be able to kind of get into the unconscious or implicit knowing very quickly. I was just struck by what you said about your dad growing up with this psychoanalytically oriented psychiatrist and that you guys didn't talk a lot about feelings. You talked a lot about thoughts. We talked about anxiety, right? So what do you think's making you anxious, Hill? If I would talk about it, you know, what do you think's going on? Uh, my mother tried to, you know, fix a lot of things to make me feel better as opposed to leaning into, um, for example, sadness, which is something we didn't do in my family. And when we don't grow up being able to make space for an emotion because our parents react to it, we learn to shut that emotion down or to cordon it off. So I just would get anxious when anything sad came up. And so, you know, so I talked a lot about anxiety. Yeah, it reminds me, it reminds me of, uh, of supervisors who, as they were teaching me to be a therapist, would emphasize so mu how, how much of me as a physician wanted to think and how there was such an important uh, step that was missing in that model of sitting in the feeling and trusting the feeling, and most importantly, trusting the associations, that it, it not so much necessarily the thinking and the fixing and the understanding on that cognitive level, and it's really, uh, it sounds like very related to AEDP of this idea of um, uh, making sure to honor more of what's happening in the somatic experience, more of, of what's happening in the emotional experience, more than just the, the mind and the thoughts. And, and, and so much more that I probably can't even articulate except, and maybe you could help me put language on this with um, a, like a quick story in, in psychoanalytic training. I had to be in psychoanalysis three times a week lying on the couch. And I picked a psychoanalytic, um, a very Freudian conservative analyst because um, he was a handsome older man and I thought I could work out my daddy issues and uh, all sorts of. <laughs> How'd it go? I mean, that's not a bad formula. <laughs> right, right. No, and, and, and psychoanalysis, um, like I have no, I, my psychoanalytic training helped me tremendously, but this idea that you just lay on the couch and, and say the first thing that comes to mind, right? And so you begin to learn to understand your mind. But truthfully, from the moment I stepped into that office, I was anxious. I didn't ever talk about that I was anxious being in the office. I just pushed that away to try to think of the first thing that came to my mind. And therein lies why I wasted years, I feel like, trying to honor his model, but he wasn't able and trained. And I tried to train him when I was learning ADP, and that led to a whole other problem. But he, if he had asked me, as I ask when people come into the room, can we just slow down together for a moment, just feel your feet on the floor, feel your bottom in the chair, Take a deep breath and just kind of scan your body up and down. And what do you notice as we begin? Oh, I feel a tight, tightness in my chest. Is there a name for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious. Right. Oh, that makes sense. You're talking to a stranger and, and um, let's get to know this anxiety. So, you know, and I'll say something like, I know why I would be anxious coming, but I, I can't presume to know what it means to you to be here. And so right away, we're in the body, we're in the anxiety, and we're working our way down that triangle diagram, which helps get us out of our head, below the anxiety, and into the core feelings that we all have, 
which most people don't even realize that we have feelings that are wired in that we can't control and that we don't want to control. They're wired so that they just happen because they're the, what's mediating the the level of safety and danger in the environment from the time we're born so that we can survive. Let's talk about some of the core emotions and the change triangle also really relate. Can, can we tell us a little about the change triangle and these, these core emotions, if you could? It, so it's really AEDP. I didn't invent anything new with the change triangle. It was part of the model in AEDP. So there's understanding how emotions work that the change triangle diagrammed. And then there is how to be with people so that you co-create uh, enough safety that allows people to have a new experience that we are trained to make sure that that experience, even though it may be painful or difficult, is good at the end, not re-traumatizing people. We talk about this uh, the sort of reparative emotional experience is often how this has been talked about. That is, if you are uh, not used to being, if your caregivers aren't trustworthy, let's say, or dependable, part, part of uh, uh, the therapeutic value uh, um, of being in, in, in therapy for someone in that setting would be explicitly getting into that issue and 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 kind of uh, meaning that what comes up as you're in a relationship that does have consistency does have boundaries, um, and, and then the reparative experience of that. Yes, and so that's very healing. Um, and then there's sort of the how do we create from the get go enough safety to allow someone to have an experience of themselves that then leads to an experience of having that experience of yourself of, that's open and authentic with me, another person, and, and the processing of that. It, it's, it, it, it's so hard to sort of, um, I mean, that's why it, it, uh, in the book, I, I wrote these stories that show verbatim as I'm explaining what's going on, where I can sort of show what ADP is like and show how to work the change triangle. But it's hard to describe unless you, like, what does it mean to have an experience of your emotions? Like, just me saying that to you, you may know, you may know a little bit of it. Um, but well, I think everybody listening has, uh, uh, resonates with something that you're talking about, which is, there are certain aspects to the self, certain feelings that we have that we don't have many uh, safe space to air out. If you're in your 40s and let's say a traumatic event from your teens is really coming up in your dreams and making you anxious and floating around in your mind, you know, a lot of people, there's not a spot to come and sit. And I would, I would say explore that and experiment a little bit with it. Because part of what you're sharing, this notion of authentic self and core emotions Part of the um, discovery of that is the exploration of that, or you know, and, and, and having the opportunity to be able to talk and think about it in non-permanent ways in therapy. You can come in and you know, be sure that you're going to sell it all and go be a goat farmer uh, this week, and next week come in and 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 talk about how that was such a powerful idea and it's led to that next thing. And I'm not saying, wait, you know, what about the goats? Right? There, there's not a there, there's um. Um, it reminds me a lot of AI, this stateless thing, you know, this idea that the session is able to exist related to all the language that has gotten created between the patient and the therapist, but in some ways a little almost independent of it, that a new idea can come in totally fresh without a defensiveness or, a, I don't know, or, or, or a, a, you know, a, a notion that we can't continue exploring, that there has to be a permanent identity as opposed to other relationships, friends, family, right? Whereas you explore some things about your authentic self that might be frightening or unknown, it's hard to trot those out in some of those relationships and explore them. Yeah. And what really helps is this other piece of the work that I bring in to the book is really about thinking of us in parts, yeah, well, I feel like we use a bunch of terms. I want to go through them just so everybody listening. We've talked about the change triangle, and I wonder if you can define that for us and then tell us about core emotions. Yes. Um, now, I wonder, I, I think for people listening, it would be helpful if you just Google the change triangle so you can see 
the image of it, a picture. Yeah, is- and we'll, we'll, we'll put it up in the show notes as well, everybody. And I think you've got a really nice PDF uh, to your site that we'll link to that I downloaded. So Yeah, and all the blogs, everything is sort of using the change triangle as the guide. Because so this is something that I didn't invent. It was written about since the 70s in the academic literature. And when I saw it at that conference back in 2004, when I first encountered AEDP, I just thought this is something, if I was, if I had seen this diagram when I was 18, it would have made a big difference. It would have helped me navigate um, and understand myself and navigate life better. So it's an upside down triangle um, where the three corners of the triangle are the core emotions at the bottom. And the reason there, if you imagine this triangle superimposed on your body, the point would be in your in in your core, where core emotions arise, and these core emotions, which have been written about since the time of Darwin and James and um, many other writers have have researched them, but these are the wired in emotions that are for survival, and that's why we evolved uh, to have them. Uh, why we are just not like Spock, that emotions give us an advantage, even though they're painful. And what they, the purpose of of a core emotion is it's got in the program, uh, sadness. Let me just tell you what the core emotions are. So we don't keep people in suspense, sadness, anger, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. Um, There are other ones. These are the ones that get people into most trouble when they're buried. And what happens is each one of these core emotions has a separate program for action. That's why when they get set off in the middle of the brain, they activate the body through the vagus nerve first, because that's the whole purpose of a core emotion is to make us move towards an adaptive action that helps us survive and thrive in life. So these will come up in life. Um, We've also got, if you, on the top of the triangle, the upper right-hand corner has these inhibitory emotions on it. And in, inhibitory emotions are anxiety, guilt, and shame. And these are three different emotions that do a very good job of pushing down the core emotions. And their job is to keep us connected, positively connected to other humans, because that also helps us survive. So for example, I can fight better in a group and protect my goods in my home if I have uh, if I have a tribe where we're all looking out for each other and getting food for each other. So getting along with people is very, very important. And in fact, when we're born as child as babies and children, it's of primary importance to be positively and safely connected with our mother. So that if our mother doesn't like our expressions of anger or sadness or fear, uh, and babies have them all, you know, you're a father. If you, you can see their children's and inhibitions aren't, um, emotions aren't yet inhibited. But if the parent shows disapproval, the child will feel, um, unconsciously or implicitly will stop that emotion from happening by kind of squashing it in these various ways so that the child can stay positively connected and get the mother's approval or, you know, closeness. So, and I think most people can understand like that type of idea um, that if a baby shows anger or think of a toddler saying no or saying, I hate you or something, you know, like that type of thing, the way the parent responds to that will affect how the child how the how the child processes and makes space for that emotion that they're showing. And so the going back to the why the triangle the, the change triangle is so useful is that if we understand that our core emotions are normal, and if we understand that we have throughout our childhood and adulthood had to block core emotions for various reasons to stay in the good graces of the people we need. And if we understand that because emotions, core and inhibitory emotions feel so awful when they're swirling around in the body with no place to go, that there's no outlet for them, that we need defenses, which are on the top 
left-hand corner of the change triangle to cope and defenses unlike I learned in psychoanalysis where they had a pejorative or judgmental, you know, it's like you're being resistant or you're using defensive. We don't do it. We don't talk about it that way in AEDP that defenses we need, that they are protective, that they are these ingenious creative ways that our mind and body has figured out how to go on with life get along with people, and to spare us emotional pain all at the same time. And so looking at defenses, anxiety, and core emotions, we can locate ourselves on one of those three corners anytime really throughout the day. Hmm. And it's important because we want to always be, ideally, mental health means being in tune and able to tolerate our and know that we're having and tend to the core emotions. And when we do do that, and that has to be in the body, when we can stay with a core emotion and, and allow the energy that they all have, not energy in the woo-woo 70s California way that my father scoffed at, which is why we didn't really talk about emotions in that way. It was all about being bigger than our emotions and being stronger than our, our emotions and picking ourselves up by our bootstraps and you know what I mean? That whole like a puritanical um, uh, cognitive version of psychoanalytic thought. You know, and I was just just he, you know hearing that version, right? Of, of um, you know being having defenses is, is bad and transcending our emotional life reminds me of something that concerned me when I started the field. I'd see a lot of like analysts and anal- entering some of the last chapters, let's say sixty plus of their career, and they wouldn't have affect anymore. Yeah. And it was like nothing, nothing really seemed to get stirred. And, and, and I think it was this old school model that it almost is kind of fearful of emotions, right? If you're creative, you're hypomanic. If you're emotional, you're borderline. If you're, and, and, and I think, I don't think modern therapy and psychoanalysis or actually in practice, it, it is often like that for anybody who's successful, because I don't think that model works very well, but it's funny how much it's in, you know, it's sort of around for all of us still. Absolutely. The whole culture and society and really the, the most of the world is emotion phobic and highly dysfunctional. (laughs) Well, walk us through it. It sounded complicated. And I don't think it's like you walk us through it in the sense of, if I got this change triangle in my mind, like you, and I'm sitting here and I'm feeling something powerful. And I'm wondering if you could watch it. If I'm feeling a powerful core emotion, like uh, I talked to my colleague, Don Meet Seti a lot, who has this great book, Joy is My Justice. She was, uh, we had her, her on this uh, episode, had an episode with her. So joy is a core emotion that I've been trying to focus more on. Maybe that's one that we should think about. Maybe one that's maybe more common for all of us is anger. But I wonder if you can walk us through dealing with one of these core emotions. We've got it. We're filled with that excitement, sexual excitement, joy. And also, what do we do when we feel one of these really inhibitory emotions like, you know, guilt or shame? So it's a, do you, do you want me to describe it in a framework? So as a self-help tool, so that when I'm, when I'm alone now and I, feel that shift and jolt into. I wish we could take a vote for everyone. I think that's what we all want. We want, we want some tools for when we're alone. We're having some of these powerful feelings, either inhibitory or core, a little bit of like, what would you recommend we do? Yeah. So what I recommend is that you first learn how to work the change triangle and um, that you would learn in my book. I think it's the only book in the world that talks about how to work the change triangle for the public, right? The alternative is you could go into ADP training, but this is much better. So, so what? So to work the change triangle, you have to be aware and you have to be willing to to notice what's happening below the neck. And there are many people that have suffered so much that even to be in their body is impossible. And so, when there's a roadblock to that, that's when you would know you would need the the other the other heart and the other mind to help help your bo- your mind and body relearn that it's safe to know what you're experiencing inside. But let's say you're me and you've practiced this change triangle now for um, almost 20 years. Uh, 
you're going on, I'm, let's say, I'll just use me as an example, I'm going on with my day and all of a sudden, um, let's say I'm, I'm in New York City walking on the street and somebody bumps into me hard, right? And I'm jolted. The first thing I'm going to notice besides that it might hurt is that my emotion, my emotional state is going to change rapidly from being calm and happy to being probably annoyed, right? Because anger comes up naturally. Somebody, you know, jolts you, hits you. It's not on purpose, but anger doesn't know that. It just knows that you were sort of attacked, right? To use like that a dramatic word. And so some somebody did something to me and I'm going to notice a state shift into something. And with that awareness, I, I used to go up into my head and start to gnash and ruminate. Ah, that person just bumped in. But now if I wanted to work with that emotion more efficiently, I would go into my body and I would notice, okay, something just happened. What am I feeling? What's the sensation? Ugh. You know, I, I know I'm feeling angry because I want to like jolt that guy back. And um, I notice that I want to go up in my head and think, you know, mean thoughts. How could that guy do that? Um, so I'm going to name that I, I know that I feel anger. And so I'm going to say to myself, I, you feel anger. That's what's going on. That makes sense because somebody just bumped into you. That's a very simple thing. And then what I might do is stay with the feeling of anger in my body, breathing and noticing if there's an impulse so it doesn't get stuck. I don't want to push it away. I want to be with the, the physicality of it. And I want it to release either by following, the, staying with the tension in my body or the energy in my body or what, however it's manifesting. Sometimes I'll use a fantasy, which I show in the book, which is hard for people to understand. But emotions, the brain doesn't know so much the difference between fantasy and reality. So you might know these studies where you can hook some up to an fMRI and have them imagine running and lights up the, the muscles that would happen when you're actually running so that you can use fantasy. Uh, and I teach this to people in my, in my work, both as an emotion educator and as a psychotherapist, um, so that you don't slug your partner in the face, but you can imagine slugging your partner in the face, not for the sake of the relationship, but to release the anger that's stuck in the body and once that's released, often there's good feelings that then come back and the, the, the body re-regulates. So this might sound very, very confusing and murky. It's, it's because I'm trying to get a lot of information into a kind of a short quip. No, it, it doesn't sound confusing and murky. It sounds like just for all of us, you know, kind of listening and, and thinking through how to apply the change triangle and a, apply some of these skills. It sounds like the first one is around really... When something happens, you notice a shift in your system, stopping and doing your best to, to name it. And maybe it doesn't have one name, but to really try and think about uh, and check out the download, the list of core emotions and think, okay, what what's going on? And then instead of getting into the thoughts, oh, I'm going to get that guy or what was he thinking? And it is the part that's tricky for all of us to, to stick in the feeling in the body and in the fantasy. Yes, that's one way to, to discharge the energy of an emotion is through fantasy. Um, there are other ways. Uh, singing and dancing, I'm hoping, is one. Yes. Maybe like <laughs> chopping vegetables, I get a lot of mileage out of that one. Exactly. Um, exactly. Exactly. It doesn't sound murky. It sounds like uh, uh, one acknowledging more is going on than just thoughts and thinking. There's a lot happening in our body. And two, that it's disorienting when we have physiological or what feels like physiological experiences and they're and some of the, you're saying they're emotions that we're not naming exactly uh, i'm wondering exactly. some of the then the like the basics of emotion education you, you do these great workshops uh we're going to link to them in the show notes everyone so so check them out uh, as i said in, in the very beginning you know we talk a lot about emotional awareness and self-awareness and emotional expression is is really core tenets of mental fitness right if if you're not able to do that, you're really not able to navigate mental health as 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 best you you are uh, could. 
Um, I would say the change triangle has the crux of mental fi- fitness in there. That it's like that's why the classes are called Emotions Education One Hundred and One. It's the it's the the minimum just to see what this diagram looks like. Yeah, well, can, I wonder if you can share a little bit some of the pearls, some of the you know pieces or prompts that you really think we all should have in our minds as we're thinking about you know improving our emotional awareness. Because I think all all of us are in a quest to do that. Well, first I would say is that most of us live on the top of the triangle, that we, most of us are in our defenses and in inhibitory emotions for many reasons. It's a symptom of, of really the lack of emotion education and priority for that in our cultures. What do you think the cost of that is? Anxiety, depression, addiction, everything in the DSM-4 practically besides those that are organic uh, diseases. Because every symptom can be explained on the top of the triangle, basically. So that's why AEDP is just such a lovely model because where whatever people come in with, that's where we begin. And right in one session, we can, somebody who comes in, with, uh, with depression, we can really start to get to those underlying emotions by thinking of depression as a brilliant way that, that you, this person, has figured out not to feel all these feelings that are underneath. And can we go back to when you first started to get depressed and what was happening at the time and we're, we're, that's where we're going to find all these natural emotions that were coming up. And um, that because there's no emotion education, we in our society, we, we just learn to bury them, push them aside. And eventually we start to get symptomatic and the anxiety starts to break through or the low self-esteem that has to do with shame and withdrawal and hiding. And um, if we have the roadmap, It may, you know, working the change triangle is a lifetime, just like going to the gym, right? That we we don't stop going to the gym. We're always working to stay healthy and strong. And the change triangle is really the map to identify what's going on and how to get to the next better place. What I didn't mention on the change triangle is this place underneath it that's called the open-hearted state of the authentic self, Mm. The way we access Sounds like that. my favorite band. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good band name. The way we get to that is by the fork in the road when we have a core emotion, where when we have a core emotion that comes up, whether it's sadness or fear, or anger, or disgust, or joy, which we can talk about. I'm also very interested in joy and lots of great research on the importance of joy, is that when we a core emotion comes up, we have a choice. We can block it and bury it, or we can experience it and tend to it. And when we ride that wave and let the emotional energy come up and then back down, regulating the body, calming the body back down, then we, we with more and more reliability, get into that open-hearted state of the authentic self, which is just a, a, a non-jargony way of saying nervous system regulation. That open-hearted state of the authentic self, I think... It, can be challenging because we like control. Um, I, I've been um, thinking a lot of, about, uh, I guess, substances and how they control our mood uh, as I as I have been drinking, and I've uh, particularly been thinking about um, nights I've been out and this kind of feeling of uh, like euphoria um, that I've been at times experiencing, and and I've noticed uh, not that I get out too much anymore these days, but. I've noticed a feeling as I go out of, of a, um, say anxiety, but kind of like wondering whether it's going to happen. Like, is it going to be fun being out without alcohol? And, um, and, and, and there's, and there's something about not being in control of that. You know, like when you're out and drinking, you kind of have a, you have something that really, you're not feeling this way, not feeling that you can have another, or you can have a water or you can have a co right? but there's something, um, about not having control about access to the authentic self, I think is particularly troubling for humans, but also for patients who are struggling with symptoms. 
Now, this all sounds very good, but when we're really depressed, thinking about it as a brilliant defense is that's hard. And, and I'm wondering with the, the control aspect, how, I mean, whether I guess there are certain aspects of how you work the change triangle that you feel have really given you a better sense of emotional control and mastery. Oh, it's been transformational for me. And it's interesting about the idea of control because I, 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 I think I'm a reformed control freak in many ways. I didn't even know how controlling I was because I was living in my defenses. I just thought this is me. I just need order. I just get tense if, uh, I didn't even know I got tense. I just got, you know, this sort of, you know, that tightness that one feels when like, when things are out of order. And, um, you know, what I, what I would say to sort of address what you're saying about control, and I'm hoping I'm understanding it, is that we can control, we can gain control using our defenses to control but we can also be in the open-hearted state of the authentic self and use and con- and and get control in a i guess in an in a mindful and flexible way so so well let me come back to you for example are you saying that the lack of control to get in your authentic self is from knowing you're not going to be able to drink to relax yourself? I think it's about um, uh, uh, an anxiety around the unanticipated self-state, maybe. Uh, not, not so much that I, I need to kind of constantly soothe or regulate, but more mm-hmm. of just um, not exactly having the same formula as maybe in the past of what a good night out looks like or feels like. And I think the control is, is where there's like a automaticity, a automatic nature to that and a certain type of, of going out. Meaning that there's a certain predictability if you have a couple of drinks that no matter what, you'll have a good time. Relax a little bit, that you know, let down a little bit, whatever. Uh, you know, if you're a little silly or goofy or rambunctious a few hours, then everybody knows you had a couple extra. Whereas like, what if you're the freak on the dance floor and you're totally sober? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just, just like a little bit of it, or what if you know? Yeah. I was at a I was at a conference and I was like, I was really I was really in this, this great mood, and I was like, man, what did you take? That's what people like, said, or that's yeah. what people thought people were saying. <laughs> yeah, and it was just this uh, like, isn't that hey. terrible? Right? That's that's what I mean about like to say something like that. I mean, unless it wasn't, it didn't come off. Did it make you feel, did it bring up shame that you were being like weird or judged? Uh, no, I mean, maybe a little, not, not, I don't think it was intended that way. I think it, it, it struck me and it kind of stuck with me as, um, that were, uh, it struck me in the way that you're talking about from an emotional education standpoint, when we get the giggles, when we get creative, when we get euphoric, when we get excitable, when we get, um, uh, sparky, I call it. You know, there's something that, that in the absence of uh, maybe substances, it's a little uncomfortable about that. There's a joyousness and a, and a, and, and a you know, it feels almost like a little unhinged. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the free expression of emotions and how people respond to that. I think so, and 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 and, and probably the the um, the exploration of of some of those more maybe extreme ones like joyfulness. Yeah. Uh, euphoria or the one I think is therapists we appreciate right that uh that kind of co-created associative closeness that happens between people when they're very authentically honest so fantastic that's a few things better I agree yeah, I think that's true hey uh, speaking of that I got I got I got a dad question for you here that's been on my mind and I, and I hadn't remembered that your dad was a psychoanalytically inclined psychodynamic psych psychiatrist like someone else in the zoom room right now and i've been thinking a lot about raising kids and in particular i've been thinking uh, and around that cliche right that like oh like your dad's a therapist like well how are you guys feeling how was school i I really hate that trope about mental health professionals that somehow because i care about the emotional life of my kids family etc that i'm gonna like mess it up and be a weirdo and at the same time my analyst said it really well it's kind of like teachers because we're used to living kind of inside the mind of another, 
and, and having the permission professionally to do that, right. That's, you know, I, I just spent the last five hours like in someone else's world with their permission. There's something about parenting that's really tough because it's not exactly, that's not it. Like that, 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 you know, it's your kid's mind. And so I, there's a long window. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what tips you have for me as a psychiatrist about making sure to avoid the missteps of generation pasts of psychiatrist dads. And I made all the mistakes and then I learned, I didn't learn the change triangle until my kids were, until I already made damage. But I do have advice for parents out there. In fact, I was, I'm in the middle of, with a book proposal for the emotional lives of parents. And the, it's just to, to not say anything. It's to be a step behind. Well, that's so hard for us as parents. But what do you mean be a step behind? It means that when your kid comes home from school, just hang out with them and let them. When I go in, I say, hey, time for, like, give me the report. There's a lot of pressure that I'm bringing, even if I'm trying to be light about it. And, and literally just sit down. How's it going? Read a book, hang out, do what, kind of mirror what they're doing and, and see what happens. Is there a way that I can be curious that isn't mm. intrusive? I think um, what you do is very similar to what we are trained in as AEDP therapists is it's not what happens. This is a great mantra. It's with all relationships. It's not what happens. It's what happens next. So what that means is you could say to your kid, Hey, do you want to, you know, what was the highlight of school today? And if they change the subject, give you a look, avoid the question, then what happens next is I don't want to, if you read between the lines, I don't want to talk about it. And then don't ask. What do you think about that? I'm like digesting it. You know, I'm trying to think about it for all of us listening in kind of real time, right, of, of the... Uh, and especially that pressure, I think all of us as modern parents feel to be attentive, thoughtful, sensitive, uh, to understand our pronouns, to understand this this generation is a little different than we were and a lot different in some ways and that uh, we want to do a different job uh, than the generations before us have in terms of how we approach that maybe with more curiosity and less judgment, mm -hmm. you know. Less, yeah. oh, I walked through 10 miles of snow to the school and more, how was your walk to school? <laughs> and yeah. wow, the weather's changed a lot. So, uh, yeah, so I think when you ask how, how it's sitting with me is, is um, you know, I'm a dad. It's about, in some ways, quickly about the actualization. You know, how do I, how do I think about this? What of that am I doing? My impulse is usually to go throw the ball um, uh, in sense that it, it feels... Uh, um, it feels like doing something and accomplishing something together that's like simple and joyful. And, and um, were the ways that your dad did it well, that like you, met, you remember certain settings where that desire for some emotional fluency worked? Yeah. I mean, we, we, but he didn't really go deep with me. He wasn't that interested in, in me. He was, we, we, I think to connect to him, I, we would talk about analytic theories together. Um, my, my mother was a little more, you know, in there with him. I don't know. I don't, I, I just want to know if I do that with my daughter, I'm going to let her know it was your idea. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Sweetie. It's like character structure. And yeah. daddy just wants to, daddy just wants to talk borderline for a little while. <laughs> you don't talk micropsychotic episodes. No, but get this New York city public schools, seventh grade. We read Freud. Um, Mr. Morris, who since died of AIDS, was the best teacher I ever had. And we would read Freud and talk about it in seventh grade. We did a Freudian interpretation of Genesis in the Bible. <laughs> wow. That's a great yeah. seventh grade project. Yeah. So that's so uh, I was I loved it. I was always interested in um, I was analyzing my friends when I by the time I was in eighth grade and losing them too because just like the way kids nobody wants to be intruded upon psychically. So my friends were like, if you don't cut it out, <laughs> we're not going to be your friends. Stop analyzing me. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's the worst of I would call the psychoanalytic and psychiatric movement around yeah. you know diagnosis is comes from a hierarchical and judgmental stance. Mm. 
you've got this icky thing and I know all about it and the power rests within me, the clinician. That's right. That's and, right. And, and I think that, I think there's been a, a huge shift that hasn't, you know, in some parts, in some corners of mental health hasn't, you know, people didn't get the notice. I think in particularly one of the reasons I love your work so much, Hillary, is I don't think the public has heard so much. I think people still like to make Freud jokes and then they don't understand that psychoanalysts look and sound like you. Mm. And, and, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons our emotional education and development is, is lagging and is hurting. You know, it's why our country in some ways is not um, uh, transcending its aggression into compassion and creativity and productivity and instead, you know, really, really liking to roll down on the dirt and punch ourselves a little bit more. I'm, I'm right with you. I mean, really, I think emotions education has the power to change the world for precisely that reason where aggression is really because no one, people don't know how to manage anger and they act it out. Well, I think it's that thing that you were talking about of, of, of sitting with it in giving it the freedom to take life, but that doesn't mean the only way to express anger is to discharge it with your fists or with your nasty words. That's exactly right. And and I also feel like that doesn't, you know, that never feels good. I mean, like, you know, just watch dogs fight. As soon as they finish, they're looking at each other like, what was that? <laughs> that right. doesn't feel good at all. it's a primitive emotion that just... A very unleashed. primitive emotion. Yeah. I mean, all the core emotions are primitive in a way, Um but what we want to do is be able to make use of them, constructive use. So we have to know that we're having them. We have to be able to have the energy discharge. And then so we can think again on how to use it in our benefit and the benefit of the relationships we care about. And then the oh, greater that's really helpful. That, that's helping me right now. And I, maybe everyone else saw that, that, that notion that part of what has happened is there are a set of feelings that we have been uh, taught to inhibit. If you think about sexual excitement, Right. As a young man or a young woman, boy, there's a lot of like cultural and parental response and values about that. And, and AEDP and in some ways psychotherapy as a whole field asks us to sit within our feelings, describe them better, honor them as true. And then I think the part that, that really is uh, gets missed is that you using uh, self-reflection, whether it's uh, therapy or journaling, and, and using it to have a transformative self-experience. Absolutely, that's what it's all about. And often, what people don't know, and what they don't, what they didn't teach me in psychoanalytic training, is that insight often comes on the heels of experiencing a core emotion, because it's that's the, what's really unlocks the unconscious. You know, I also say that sometimes when I'm, I'm speaking with couples and or, or, or an individual about like a fight, it's like, oh, and then I screamed. And I can't believe I said it. I said, well, oh, that sounds brutally honest. You know, it's like where the, the, the you know, if, if anger gets you to that four line sentence that is the honest truth about the state of why you're so mad, that, that's so useful. Right? It's so clean and, 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 and specific and clear. And, um, well, Hillary, this has been wonderful. I, I, I don't want to end without hearing along with the change triangle, just a couple of quick, uh, ideas around things in your life as, uh, as an analyst, as a mom, as a wife, as a businesswoman, as an ex dentist, um, as the daughter of, uh, a psychiatrist. What did your mom do? I feel like we can't just talk about what your dad did. You know, it's like, well, so my, weird. my mom is, is just a rare, wonderful, it was the best mom. She had an amazing career. She was first a teacher and a guidance counselor. I think she was the youngest guidance counselor in the New York City school system, then raised us, then went back to work and found her calling as an, as an artist, really. She was an interior designer to the intellectual artistic elite of New York, Leonard Bernstein's decorator at the Dakota and in his country house, Madeline Kahn, William Friedkin, Sidney Lumet's decorator. I mean, a big life and supported herself after she divorced my father. On Fifth Avenue, self-made kid, woman, kid from Brooklyn who... Um, Isn't it fascinating how the patriarchy is in uh, us and in mental health in a way that we joke about or talk about your psychoanalytically oriented dad, but it takes us an entire hour to get to your 
resilient, brilliant, creative, resourceful mom who, you know, in your own arc that you share with us, this like incredible reinvention and recreation and tenacity that you know, we also, you know, we see so clearly in your life arc and story. Yeah. Yeah. She made me who I am today. And she really saved me from my father who was handsome and funny and very smart, but had some character flaws that made him difficult. We fought all the time. Well, I appreciate, <laughs> Thanks I, for letting appreciate me share. <laughs> I appreciate the psychiatry dad tips. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you, Hillary, and, and your um, request of us all that we honor our core emotions, that we sit with them more, that we think about how we inhibit them, which we all struggle with, and, and that we hear the inspiration in your story uh, that we can learn more about our emotions, uh, that there's nothing inside of us that needs to be elusive, and that to build our mental fitness, there there are a lot of models. The Change Triangle and AEDP is a very accessible one that resonates with a lot of people to, to think about um, uh, core emotions, inhibitory emotions, and defenses, and to take what can be very elusive, we said at the beginning, this is a kind of psychoanalytic language, what is the unconscious, what are psychodynamics, and, and make it very actionable and practical for us. Right. That that was exactly my intent. And I just want to add to one thing to that, that there are many people that w- are like, I want nothing to do with experiencing my emotions. I would still recommend this change triangle can just be an intellectual education to help you understand yourself, even if you never want to go into your body. It's just, it's basic, like taking high school bio and learning that you have a heart and a stomach. Oh, I just have a, I have a different response. To that. I'm, I'm not familiar with these people who don't want to experience their emotions, but my response is, well, that's, that's, a, that's just really not possible. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's, that's what you were designed to do. Like that's what all the neural connections are about is. is everybody's about afraid. Emotions are painful and they make people do bad things. Well, maybe we should say it differently. <laughs> it, it, well, it's kind of like a horse. They're very scary if you don't know about them. If you don't know how to pick up a hoof and, and, and pick it, if you don't know how to, you know, uh, brush and I've got a horse, so it's a big part of my life. I'm sort of a horse girl on the inside, but um, it, very terrifying. And it's an analogy I use with patients a lot. And also horses can't be totally trusted, kind of like feelings can't be totally trusted. Um, and at the same time, the more time you spend there, the more wonder you discover, the the more clear it becomes how to do all the things you need to do to a horse. Um, so I, I think in some ways emotions, you know, and things we're scared of is just like anything that's generally something that you should probably sit with and understand and master. Yes. And I, I think what I, my point, and I like the horse analogy, is just that the ed, the intellectual education in emotions as the first step, demystifies them enough so that you may be able to take the second step and be a little less scared about doing that, um, that deeper work. Getting curious. That's all we, I ask. Can I get you curious about this? <laughs> well, it's, it's the first step to moving out of that pattern, that often ruminative pattern. That there's nothing that can be done, that something's horribly wrong and misunderstood. Hillary, thank you for this wonderful conversation. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us and hearing all about Hillary's wonderful work as a psychoanalyst and therapist, but also about her history. And, and I hope you feel as inspired by her story as I do, this notion that our, our life path really can be such a wonderful series of experiences professionally, personally, and to be open to those changes as opposed to so often how I, I think we experience or fantasize about our life in this very linear trajectory. Um, please, please check out the show notes. We're going to link to um, all of Hillary's resources as well as her books. And uh, everyone, as always, my request, our request is that you take this episode and, and you use it for your mental fitness in a way. You think about these core emotions, whether it's for 10 minutes, whether it's this week or this month, whether you read the whole book, whether you get trained as an AED therapist, you know, somewhere on that spectrum, I hope these ideas will resonate with you and I hope them will, will help you. Uh, I hope they will help you uh, enhance your mental fitness and take whatever that next step is in understanding, exploring, and accentuating the self. Until we see you next time, everybody, keep up your good work, traversing, transforming, and transcending. Hillary, I look forward to seeing you very soon in person, my friend. 
I hope so, Drew. Take good care. Bye.